Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. I'm Susanna Johnson with What School Could Be. I am joined today by my co-host, Mel Chang, um, Director of Engagement for What School Could Be. And we are so delighted to be having a conversation with Joy Marchese, right? <laughs> Welcome, Joy. Thank I'm going to um, share just a, a quick introduction um, because this is a pretty important conversation in a lot of regards, but it's great to understand where um, Joy is coming from. So Joy's global education consultant, author, keynote speaker, parent coach, and emotional architect, which may be my new favorite phrase ever. Um, <laughs> for over 25 years, Joy has worked with thousands of children, parents, teachers, and professionals to help foster a happy and flourishing environment in the home, in schools, and in the workplace. And before we get into the conversation, I just want to share something when I was um, gearing up for this, I, I have some familiarity with your work, Joyce. I'm so excited to talk about it from other educators who have really grown a lot and gained a lot from your thinking, your ideas, and, and all that you've done um, to bring this work forward. But I, it, when I was looking at your, your background and your website for, to prepare for today, your purpose hit me. And I just wanted to share this with everybody. It's a quote from, from Joy's website. I'm driven by people and purpose. For as long as I can remember, I've had an ability to connect with people and share my passion for well-being. It is when I see that spark of passion ignite in a student or adult that I'm teaching that I know I'm fulfilling my own purpose to help, help create a world in which everyone will flourish. And to me, I feel like that sort of sets everybody up to understand a little bit more about where you're coming from and, and how this works. Um, because we have to continue to find that social emotional connection and everybody and all the research tells us that we absolutely need to have that positive mindset, positive feeling emotionally in order to be able to learn. So as an educator and in somebody who works with educators all day, every day, all I can think about is yes, please tell me how. <laughs> so welcome Joy to the conversation. Thanks Mel for being here with us. And so maybe Joy, just start us off with that, that part of the conversation is make that connection for us between this concept of emotional well-being and education in a way that, I mean, we, we all know that that's true, but tell us what that means to you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm thinking, what is my purpose? No, you know, it's interesting because I'm probably going to share at least one quote from Simon Sinek, um, who is one of, I, I just really champion his work. And, you know, what you shared is a big part of my why. Um, and I'm really big on, that's what drives me. Um, is people and purpose and having a positive impact on the world through education. So, and part of that comes from my own, um, both negative and positive experiences in education growing up. And one of the things that, that really um, struck me with positive discipline, and I will share that, you know, as an educator for over 25 years now, my first eight years of teaching, I mean, I made so many mistakes. Um, I look back and I think, oh my gosh, what happened to those kids that I was teaching in those first eight years? <laughs> you know, how did they turn out? And when I found, when I was introduced to positive discipline and the work of Dr. Jane Nelson and Lynn Lott, um, I found myself at the time teaching at Rikers Island, um, which is, if you're not familiar, it's the largest jail on the Northeast in the United States. It's actually an island right off of Manhattan. Um, just off New York City. And it's where felony criminals are um, living while they're waiting. They've already been convicted. They're waiting to be sentenced, right? And because you can be tried at the age of 16 as an adult, um, you have 16, 17, 18-year-olds in the jail. So they have a high school, a secondary school. And I remember thinking to myself at the time I was running this educational nonprofit organization and it was to empower, it was an empowerment program to build resiliency in what they called at the time at risk populations. Right. And they would say, you know, kids at risk of not fulfilling their full potential. And I just, you know, I look back now and I think what kid is not at risk of fulfilling their true potential. Right. But at the time, this was what I was doing. And they asked me, you know, oh, can you know, can you teach this program at Rikers Island? Because that way we're going to be giving these guys the tools they need so that, that eventually when they get out of jail, you know, they can make better choices. Right. And I thought, 
yeah, this would be so great. And then I remember thinking, how am I going to go in there and teach these folks? Right. And it was at, at, thankfully a colleague at the time handed me Dr. Jane Nelson's book, Positive Discipline. And I read it and I had a master's degree in education. I had a degree in psychology. And I thought, how have I been teaching eight years? I have these degrees and I've never heard of this work. And it's not just Jane's work, but it's actually the work that positive discipline is based off of, which is Adlerian psychology, Alfred Adler and Rudolf Dreikers. And I read this book and it resonated with me so much because I thought this is aligned with my values and all of the strategies I was using in the classroom to teach, just teach in general, but to teach social emotional learning, it didn't line up with my values but I didn't know what else to do. So I literally hopped on a plane like a week after I finished reading the book and I flew to San Diego and I took my first workshop with Jane, Dr. Jane Nelson and I never looked back like this was it. It became not just my educational philosophy and way of interacting with students, it became my life philosophy and the way I interacted with all human beings. And so this was kind of, this is, I was like, I couldn't believe it. You know, I had found, this is, you know, my purpose. And, you know, what I have found throughout the last, I guess, um, I don't know, 15, 18 years doing this in my own classroom and now working with educators is that we all know how important the social emotional development is, right, of young people. And yet, even with all the research, that we have backing this up. It, even when it comes to being successful human beings or successful academically, we know that this foundation has to be there first. And yet I'm still going into school after school after school where it's just another add-on. You know, like, oh, we have to tick these boxes and social emotional learning should not be a curriculum or a course. It should be woven into every thing we do, every interaction we have as human beings, right? So this is kind of, you know, when I think of it being referenced as like this separate thing, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me because it's the foundation for me. I don't know so, if that answers your question, but it gives you a little bit of background to why I do it. Yeah. Joy, um, you had mentioned that your first eight years of teaching, you're kind of wondering, like, what happened to those kids? And I, I think that's an experience that many teachers, definitely I can, you know, relate to. So in thinking about these new teachers now, like, let's save them a little bit of grief. So what would be some of those go to strategies that you would have them at least start with? So that they would be able to start integrating some of these, the positive discipline strategies within their curriculum and not having it be a standalone. There are two that I would say, if every new teacher went into their classroom, understanding these two things, it would make the biggest difference for their relationship with their students, but for their, for their classes. And the first one, which is, um, it comes from the work, but it's become my personal life mantra, which is connection before correction. Connecting with the student, the child, the colleague, the, whoever it is you're interacting with, connecting first. And then the correction piece is the teaching. You must build relationships are the key to learning. If you can't build relationships with your students, I guarantee you, they might learn something. They're not going to learn to their potential. Relationships are key. So that connection before correction piece is huge. How are you connecting with your students when they walk into your classroom every day? You know, what's the tone? And, and I say connecting with your students, but I should backtrack, actually, because the first person you have to connect to is yourself. Because we talk about, when we think about teaching and learning, if we are not connected and we're not in the right frame of mind, if we're not regulated, let's say, right? We had a bad morning getting in and we couldn't get our own kids out of the house and we hit traffic and we're running, you know, if we're not regulated going into the classroom, we can't teach well, certainly not at our best. So the first person we have to connect to is ourselves, And then we have to connect to our students. When kids feel connected, they feel a sense of belonging in our classroom, they feel safe. 
And when they feel safe, they're regulated. You know, they're, they're, they're calmer, even if they're coming from an environment where they're experiencing trauma, you know, when they, they should come into our classroom and feel safe. And if you can create community in your classroom, you are halfway there. If you have good relationships with your students. I remember like my colleagues would be like, why don't you have any behavior issues in your class? <laughs> and it wasn't because I was a pushover and I just let my students, it was a free for all. It was because it was based on mutual respect. We respected each other. And I love that. Yeah. Sorry, you were going to say? So that's the first one. Connection before correction. Relationships, relationships, relationships. And the second, and I've had colleagues say to me, it's not my job to, to build relationships or to be friends. <laughs> it's not about being friends with your students. It's about building connections, right? So, so that emotion, fulfilling that emotional need that we all have as human beings to belong to have a sense of belonging and community. So that's the first one. The second one is I think every single teacher going into a classroom needs to understand one of the most primary principles in Adlerian psychology, which is understanding that every behavior has a purpose and that we have to look beyond the behavior that we see. We use the analogy of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg, Right. That's the that's the behavior we see, but that's only 10 to 15 percent of what's going on. We have to go below the surface and we have to figure out what's driving or motivating the behavior. So Rudolf Dreikers, who carried on the work of Alfred Adler, he used to say a misbehaving child is a discouraged child. Yeah. Right now, it could be that they're discouraged because they're feeling left out or not connected. Right. It could be that they're just tired. They haven't slept or they're hungry. Like I get hangry, right? I get cranky when I'm hungry and I misbehave. Like I have a short fuse. I lose my temper. If you just give me food, I'm okay. If you try to get me to not be cranky by punishing me or yelling at me or criticizing me or nagging me or ignoring me, that's not going to meet my need and I'm still going to be cranky. So if all teachers can understand that it's not about trying to manage behavior or change behavior, control kids. It's about understanding what's driving that behavior. And when we meet the need below the surface, only then do we even have a chance of changing the behavior, right? Sometimes we temporarily can do it through punishment and rewards, but that's very short term. So these are, these are two really, I mean, Alfred Adler was born in 1870. This is not new stuff. I mean, this man was way ahead of his time. And yet we have his work out there and all the science and research right now is backing it. Right? And yet, why are we still not applying this? And I'm not saying all of us, but I still see so much where it's not my daughter's new school here. I just moved to New York and it, you know, I, I'm a little bit like uh, kind of freaking out <laughs> over what's happening. You know, she's only in kindergarten and, I, you know, I'm thinking this is like a top school district, right? On Long Island in the suburbs. And it's not being applied. A hundred percent. I think that, yeah, and I, I think that kind of leads into, so I'm, I'm always, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the neuroscience and trying to understand it. And, and I, I know this psychology and the history, but I think that there's, um, there's something that has been disconnected in terms of connecting the, the idea of the emotion and, and the, just trying to ignore this research because it does feel hard for a lot of people, for a lot of parents, for a lot of educators. How do you decide... Um, how do you decide what you're going to be focusing on? You've only got so much time and all of that, but it leads me to this question. You use the term emotional architect. And I was hopeful that you might unpack that for us because it does shift the conversation away from like, I don't know, I can't control other people's emotions or it's too hard, or I'm trying to get to content. I'm trying to get to standards and I'm also trying to get through the day and, and all of that. But so I, I like the idea of us being able to, to have more control by being the architects of these emotional things. Can you talk a little bit about what that looks like or, or how to become an emotional architect and what are the... <laughs> I'm going to sound like a broken record you know, like, when, I, when I say it starts with us. 
right? So right. if you think about it, like, so while I'm building a house in New York, right? This has been a whole thing. If you think about like building a house, where do you start? What do you have to start with when you build a house? The foundation. Yeah. No. See, everyone goes to the foundation, don't we? Oh, the plan. You got to yeah. the plan a dream. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm more. <laughs> we need the why. We need the purpose, right? Perfect. So now, plan. listen, you go into any school and they have a, a beautifully articulated mission and vision and right. That it's like there, their core values. It's there. And you know, what's interesting is they'll have this amazing vision plan and yet it's not always being carried through like i'm i'm thinking okay this is where they want to go and this is where they are like i'm not understanding where that so we have to start with the why and that has to drive everything that we do right it really has to drive the decisions we make um is is this getting us there so then what do you have to do after you have the plan then what do you have to do you have this vision what do you have to do? I, mean, I know yeah, you want to say the the foundation. <laughs> it's no, not it's the plan and the design now. It's well, yes, we have the plan, right? We get the architectural plans and all of that. Then we have to prepare the ground, right? With the clear, oh, right? Yeah. So one of the things that we need to understand, especially as adults, is what's driving our own behavior. Now we have deep rooted belief systems. Our belief systems are formed during our formative years. They're pretty fully formed by like the age of seven, give or take, right? And we spend our whole lives making decisions based off of our belief systems that were formed and we, we don't even remember, right? They're stored in our subconscious, but yet our beliefs drive our behaviors. So part of this understanding is understanding ourselves and what drives us and our behaviors right and then we're gonna lay the foundation and give the tools and all of that so a lot of this comes from our own personal reflection and awareness and growth you know gandhi said it be the change it starts with us when we're looking outside of ourselves right it's it's frustrating and as educators even as parents we will all be a lot happier as the sooner we accept that we can't control another person, even our own kids, the happier we'll be. But we can control two very important things. Do you know what they are? You're so scared. I'm giving you. Two questions. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking of my own. Like when, when you ask that question, I'm just what's driving our own behavior. So I can control my own reactions. My you own can behaviors. control yourself 100 percent. What else can you control, especially as an educator? The environment that you create, the environment. the environment, yeah, the space. Yeah. Yeah. So that makes right? yeah, I love that. Yeah. Because if it's a culture that is built around everybody trying to be owners of their own emotions and behaviors and also calm and regulating and working together, having those connections, then you're right. That is, that's the whole culture of the classroom. That is something that educators do have a lot of say in. Yeah. And when we change ourselves, mm -hmm. the environment around us changes. Mm -hmm. So that's why I said, I'm going to sound like a broken record. I'm always going to go back to, it starts with us. It starts with us. It starts with us. <laughs> It's a great record, though. Keep it right? on replay. I Good. like I it. Do the song. I can see in the in the in the comments. I just want to yeah. look at those, if that's okay, real quick. Um, this is a crucial point. Go into any school and ask the faculty, parents, students if they know the vision, mission, and if they feel it in their minds and hearts. And that's huge, right? Like that's really, really huge. We have to be on the same page, um, and. You know, when we when I go into schools and I work with educators or when I'm working with parents, I always start off by asking them two questions. The first question I ask them is, what are the challenges you're facing with your kids, with your students, with your kids? Right. Like it, you came here for a reason. If you could leave here with the solution to one challenge, what would it be? And and it doesn't matter where I go in the world. It doesn't matter. I mean, really, Middle East, Asia, Europe, United States, doesn't matter where I go. And it doesn't matter if I'm talking to parents or, or educators, the list of challenges is like the same. 
with a few exceptions if there's some major like you know something going on within the country and and whatnot but they're you know they're going through the same challenges so we're all kind of at this same starting point in a sense right and then i asked them if you could imagine your student or your child like 25 years from now they're a young adult right they hopefully moved out of their parents' house. Maybe they've graduated university. Maybe they're out getting their first real job. What are the important characteristics and life skills that you want for your kids to be happy, successful, contributing global citizens? Like what is important? And without a doubt, it's the same no matter where I go. It's things like empathy, resilient, responsible, independent, compassionate, confident, sense of humor, but no one ever puts a mathematician, a scientist, an avid reader speaking five languages. They don't put the academics up there. They put all the social, emotional character development, right? They put it all up there. And that becomes our GPS. That becomes our compass. So everything we apply, we have to be thinking, what am I teaching? Like, what is the student learning in this scenario? And if they're not learning at least one or more of those characteristics or life skills, there's probably a better way of doing it, right? We're not really, so we always have to go back to our vision, our mission, our why, our, what is it that, you know, our purpose. Yeah, I love that. And, and if I could just follow up really quickly, um, the, I have the question just, you know, the brief, brief question of how much pushback do you get from families and parents when you remind them of this agenda, when they're talking about test scores or, you know, competencies or, or anything else, because, you know, it all makes perfect sense. And yet I can imagine that there are many educators watching this and listening to this conversation saying, yeah, but every time I try to carve space out and make this the priority in the classroom, I get questions about homework, questions about how they're reading, questions about how their math skills are coming along, because that's what's been put into our brains for a couple of decades now, more than a couple of decades, as the important stuff. And yet no one wants this for their kids. Nobody wants this for the future citizens that stand next to them after they get out into yeah. the world. You know, we want the social emotionally strong. We want people to be confident, joyful. And so this curious. is where we need to combine the research and the science and we need to educate parents and this is the deal parents every parent as far as i'm concerned is doing the best they can right like we're all doing the best that we can and no one i know went to school went to university to become a parent right like we didn't there's no like manual for parenting although there is because there's lots of books right but you know no one no one went to school to become a parent we all went to school to become educators so we have this knowledge and this understanding and so we need to share it with parents right so the beauty for me about positive discipline and, and the organization and what makes it stand out is that we're not just going into schools and training teachers and educating educators and administrators, the parent education piece is huge. It actually, the parent piece came before the classroom piece. You know, Jane Nelson's original book was geared toward parents more than it was educators. And so it's essential that schools provide this information for parents. And I'm thinking about, you know, you bring up this homework and this is why I do those two lists, because what I share with parents is, first of all, the, the list of challenges that they're facing. The beautiful thing about those is those challenges are the opportunities to teach all the life skills. So like when a kid's pushing our buttons, won't do their, it's an opportunity for us to teach respect, responsibility, perseverance, resilience, right? Those are the opportunities. So that's a wonderful thing, but that's a big paradigm shift. For people to go, yay, my kid's like throwing a temper tantrum. What an opportunity, you know, that's that's hard. But that's why when I'm working with parents, I'm always going, you guys made this list. I asked you what you want for your kids and none of you put mathematics, science, reading, writing, languages. The, you put this, 
right? So that's coming from them. I'm not giving it to them. It's coming from them. So I'm always going back to that, always going back to that. And I'm struggling. My daughter's five. She just started kindergarten this year. And um, she's been in like Montessori and she was in a, a, a bilingual um, preschool last year. And it was very Montessori hands-on. And now she is going to a public school here and she's five. And she has homework every single night. And she's coming home with worksheets that she does in class. And then she's got worksheets for homework. And I'm like, like, it's giving me like uh, palpitations. And I was like, and she's looked at me one day and she was, mama, this is so stupid. And we don't use the word stupid. Like she knows it's not a word. And, and she, I go, Chloe, that's it. She goes, it's boring. And I'm not learning. And I looked at her and I said, you're right. Let's not do it. What would you like to do instead? <laughs> like that was it. And then she said, we can play school and I can be the teacher. And I said to her, and I had said to her teacher before this, I said, listen, don't be surprised. I'm just giving you a heads up. If Chloe doesn't turn in her homework every Friday, please, you know, talk to me. Don't punish her because I'm not. I don't believe in giving homework at this age. I think it's pointless. I think it, right? So I shared my thoughts. And you know what's interesting? It took me, um, me, I shouldn't say me. It took us, I was a teacher at the American School in London um, for 10 years. And um, it took the, the primary school principal two years to go through the process of eliminating homework from the primary, from, from K- K2 to grade four, they eliminated the homework aside from reading. They wanted kids had to read every day. Other than that, there was no homework given by the teachers. It took two years to transition into that. And it was easier to get the teachers to agree than the parents. And the mm -hmm. way she got the parents to agree, and you'll still never get 100% of the people ever, right? The way she got them is she hit them with the science. She hit them with the science. She, these are really educated folks and when she hit them with the science and this research and the studies 80 at least 80 percent of them were on board and if you get 80 percent buy-in you can make it successful but it really took change is hard and like you said Susanna we've been this has been ingrained into our head right on our educational and this is how we educate and this is how we do it. My daughter is being taught almost exactly the way I was 40 years ago. And I'm thinking, how has this not changed in 40 years when we have all this research, right? So I, I, I wanna do a little experiment with you and I'll, I'll let's just experience right now because this is something that makes positive discipline very unique. It's experiential, okay? We know that what we hear, we forget. So you might be enjoying this conversation or not, but you'll forget most of it because we don't retain it all. If I were showing you demonstrations, you'll probably remember it, but you might not apply it. But if we experience it, we learn it and we're more likely to apply it. So I want us to do this quick experiment. And those of you watching, whether it's the recording or live, I want you to do this with us. Okay, so I want Mel and Susanna, I want you to take your hands and just link your hands together like this. And I want you to notice which thumb is on top. You're going to have either your right or your left thumb on top. Okay, got it? Now I want you to take your hands apart. You're going to link them again, but the other thumb has to be on top. Got it? How does that feel? Awkward. <laughs> Awkward. Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah, a little bit, but it's definitely, you know, like it's, <laughs> it's still familiar. It's not quite as, as comfortable. A little bit yeah. uncomfortable, a little awkward. Now I want you to do something. Take them apart, shake them out, shake them, shake them, shake them. Don't even think about it. Just put your hands together. What happened? Back Where's to the original. Your, um, the original. It's the original. <laughs> the original, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So this is change. And thank you. I can see people are participating in the chat. This is how it feels. <laughs> change is uncomfortable. Change doesn't happen overnight. So I had to shake it out. You put it and you went back to the original state. So in order for that second way to go back, that second way to become the natural way, you'd have to do this like 
10,000 times, right? Until that became comfortable to you. And it would take a lot of awareness and, and effort and time and thought to do that. So that's one of the reasons we haven't progressed is because change is hard and we usually go the easy way and we give up because we say this doesn't work, but we haven't given it the time. That's just my opinion. <laughs> Can no, you see I, I feel love really that. strongly I, about it? <laughs> I do. No, and, but it's so fantastic. And it's, it's great to address this from the perspective of, of this is hard. It is hard mm -hmm. to make change. And I know that's been the conversation that everybody who's in the room virtually and later on is, is having is that we know how hard it is for everyone to make change. So I just wanted to leave it at that, Mel. Yeah. You know, what I was thinking about is uh, another potential reason that this is making or change is really difficult is because the content areas are, are easy to measure in the sense that parents are able to see if the child is growing in math or growing in reading because we have these established benchmarks. But do you have any suggestions as to how we could get evidence of this deeper kind of learning um, for like resilience or any of those other qualities that we know now, are important? That's like the million dollar question right now. <laughs> And I will say, um, in the Positive Discipline Association, the nonprofit organization, they are just about to have the, the research based and the proof um, of it. Now, I can tell you through over 15 years, I see it. The proof is in the pudding. Like, I have experienced it. I see it. Um, but to measure it is really hard. However, it can be measured, and I would really recommend, um, I have no doubt that anyone interested in social-emotional learning is familiar with CASEL, right? And CASEL, everything they back, and they're about to back positive discipline, they've always kind of backed us, but everything is research-based, you know? And they're looking at how are we assessing this? And um, it takes time to assess because you have to look at it over time. Mm -hmm. You know, my assessment has always been all the students that come back to me, you know, and say, Miss Marchese, you were right. And this is, you know, um, and, you know, that's my, you know, proof. But I think one of the things that I have always seen is the proof for me, I never needed that, that science to show me because I saw it in my relationships. I saw it in my students' behavior. So you'll see the change. But sometimes, like you said, you don't, sometimes the change take, you don't see it right away. It's not instant results. And we live in a time for instant gratification. We want everything right now. And this isn't it. However, we do need that research, Mel, to back it up, or people yeah. will not take it. You know, they'll just, I love the way they say, you know, this is like touchy feely or soft skills. I mean, they're the hardest skills to teach and learn. Why are we calling them soft skills? Right. And they're called life skills because they take a lifetime to learn. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, that's an interesting thing. So the assessment piece is something ongoing that we are working on, working on, working on constantly. And there's a lot of organizations like Kessel. There's a lot of universities like Stanford and the Greater Good Science Center and all of these um, organizations and what they're doing at Yale and, and, you know, UPenn with all of the positive psychology. You know, it's interesting because I really think so much of Adler's work has been validated by the work done in things like positive psychology, right? That's why I say he was so ahead of his time. So the research is there now. The assessment is really, I don't think has been perfected and it's hard and you really have to do a lot of pre and post assessment, but we've really seen it even with families and that's what we're about to launch and, and, and share the research on it. So I'm, I'm excited for that to come out very soon. Thank you. I'm excited about that too. And I think that'll be a great tool for everybody um, following up on this conversation. And I'm wondering if, um, and, and I, I just want to do a quick shout out and, and make sure we kind of address this in sort of the question way from the chat, right? So Mark Lang had um, made a quote that it has been said that people are not resistant to change, but rather resistant to loss. And um, Josh from um, Most Likely to Succeed, What School Could Be in Hawaii, 
was asking about your experience with that um, in terms of that idea of loss being easier than change. <laughs> and I, I feel like it's, you know, kind of, that's, that's a, a tough thing to say, but it might be true. I think, well, I, I, I would say definitely that um, there's a lot of truth to that. And I also think for every person, it's very different, right? Because we all have such unique experiences and therefore unique perspectives. So I think for some people, the letting go and the loss bit is really hard. And for others, not so much. So I think it is quite unique to the individual. Um, but when we look at it from a brain-based perspective and we look at just like neuroscience and the neuroscience of change, I mean, you know, cre creating either changing a habit, creating a new habit, right? Like that, the brain is designed to be efficient. It's designed, it's an efficient machine and it's designed to take the path of least resistance. So the brain is always going to go back to whichever, uh, to make it simple, whichever pathway is wider and deeper, right? It, it, it's going to go back until we do enough efforts and repetition and work to create a deeper, wider pathway, right? In that sense. So it's partly kind of the neuroscience with, of change, but it also comes down again to those be embedded belief systems that we all have as unique individuals. So a lot of that is going to be based on our own experience. I love that. And I'm going to highlight the question that then Josh put into the, to follow up this, going back to Rikers Island, wondering what it's like to work with humans who have literally lost everything, especially their freedom. Are they more open to different ways of learning? And because as you were saying that, I was thinking about one of the easiest ways to build new neural pathways is when you have a brain injury because you're, you know, having to create new pathways for everything too. So it's kind of, they're, they're two separate things, but it really is like what makes us more um, open to or adaptable to, to changing those pathways in the neuroscience. So it's really interesting. We were just having this conversation in my home the other night. Um, when I was two, my father lost his right arm in an accident. I only remember him with one arm. I remember I was two, so I only remember him with the left arm. But what I do remember is his struggles, right? Having to learn as a righty everything with his left hand. And so he did really well, so well that he participated in two Paralympic games in my childhood, right? He, so he, yet, my experience is I saw him overcome his challenges. And at the same token, I also saw him um, frustrated a lot. And I, I saw him sometimes, you know, lose his temper about it or sometimes blame it. Or, you know, you ex what you experience, what I experienced as a very young child, seeing, observing my father go through this um, had a huge impact on me. So certainly I am a much more resilient person as a result because I grew up very much in a growth mindset environment, primarily because I was around disabled athletes a ton, all the time. I would have people around missing limbs, quadriplegic, you know, and I would, at five, I would race them on my knees. You know, we'd have these, you know, and, and I would play volleyball with, with them, you know, and, so I just, I think that experience really developed my own resiliency. So our experience is shape us. And on the other hand, the amount of times that I heard my father, for example, make excuses or blame or, right? I became, I do that as well. I, I picked that up from him. So, so much of this um, is, is what, what belief systems were established from a very young age. So Alfred Adler calls it our private logic. And from the time we're born, we experience our world with our five senses. What do we see, hear, taste, touch, smell, right? Like we're taking it in, we're like sponges. And the beautiful thing, uh, Dreikers used to say that kids are amazing perceivers, right? To take information in. 
However, they're poor interpreters because when you take all that in, you have to interpret the information. And because our prefrontal cortex is not developed fully to like our mid to late 20s, sometimes we interpret that information differently. That's why you have two kids living in the same household experiencing the same thing. And yet they are two totally different kids, right? Because of how they interpret that information coming in. But nonetheless, those interpretations become our belief systems. And those belief systems drive our behaviors. And our behaviors are meant to reinforce the belief system. And that makes the pathway stronger, 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 stronger. So when we go back, Mark, to your question about, oh no, who was it? Someone asked about Rikers, right? Josh, Josh, yeah. Josh thank you. It really, um, it really depends on their experiences. Some were open and many were not because they had such a fixed mindset and they had experienced so much trauma that they couldn't even, it, it, it was so many layers and layers and layers and layers and layers to get through. So um, I would say not necessarily were they more open. And many of the, many of the, um, the students that I worked with at Rikers, they had been there. This wasn't their first time, wasn't their first offense. And so you would look at it and be like, okay, so this is happening. They're not learning from this. You would think losing your freedom would be enough to say, okay, I'm not ending up back in jail. But for many of them, and this is very interesting, this was a big kind of light bulb for me. What I realized at Rikers was that, you know, almost all of the guys in there were in gangs, right? They were in rival gangs and, um, and gangs work. You know why gangs are successful? Because gangs meet those basic emotional needs that we all have as human beings, the belonging that I mentioned earlier and the significance, the sense of purpose. It gives them belonging and significance that they didn't have. And that's why they're successful. So we need to give them that in a more productive way, right? And so that was a big thing for me when I went in is how was I going to teach these folks? How was I going to connect? I had to connect. So part of that was like me asking for their help to keep them safe. I said, listen, I don't really want an armed guard in the classroom like guns while I'm teaching. I'm going to ask them to stay outside. But I need you guys to keep me safe. Right. Like, do any of you have sisters, mothers, grandmother? You know, I need you to keep. And they're like, you're one crazy. You know, I won't repeat exactly what they said. But there was a, you know, I said, I, I trust you until you give me a reason not to. And they thought I was crazy. But I had to build the connection. And they they said, we're going to keep you safe, miss. We're going to keep you safe. And they did. So. It was a big risk, but for the most part, it, it played out okay because it wasn't, I didn't look at their tip of the iceberg. I didn't look at what they did to get in there. I went right below and I said, oh my gosh, what happened? What drove them? So I didn't go in with the judgment that I would have. Because I, if I went in with the judgment, I never would have been able to connect. So that was the power. That was the buy-in for me. That was the buy-in for me. Yeah. Joy, we're entering into the last um, quarter of an hour. I mean, our, our conversation has just gone. No, no, this is great. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to shift the conversation just a little bit because we talked about classrooms and we talked about um, parents. But I know another piece of your work is also like the workplace culture. So what kinds of um, suggestions would you give to educational leaders in order for them to build resiliency in their, their staff and their faculty in, in schools, especially, um, I, I'm not sure if I should say post pandemic, but you know, several years into it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a really, okay, first up, I'm gonna start with a quote by Simon Sinek, cause I said I was gonna quote him and I am. Um, the closest thing to leadership is parenting. The more you understand about parenting, the more you understand about leadership. And the more you understand about leadership, the better parent you can become. And I'm just sharing that quote because that was one of the reasons we, we wrote this book, um, which we're going to be having that book club, which I know, Mel, you're going to explain later. 
Um, but what I noticed kind of as a parent, and I was teaching parents way before I was a parent. I felt a bit like a fraud, like how could I be teaching parents? But I can say that I understood kids. And, you know, one of the things I think that's really important, and we'll go back to what starts with you, for school leaders, I, I mean, the way I look at it right now, I mean, first of all, let me, let me backtrack. Social emotional learning is not just for kids. Like that's what I want people to walk away with. It starts with the adults in the building. Whether it's in a corporate setting, an educational setting, it starts with the adults or in a home. It starts with the adults and it starts from the top. So again, when we are responsible for our behavior, we only then can we change the behavior of our colleagues, of our children. So it doesn't really matter if you're talking about an adult and a child or two adults, because it's the same. And right now, I, I mean, I'm devastated to see the educator burnout happening right now throughout the world. I am watching amazing educators, veteran and new, and we are losing them left and right because they are burnt out. They stuck with it during the pandemic because they needed to. It was like what Adler called Gemeinschaftsgefühl, which means social interest, right? I didn't say that great with the accent, but you know, it's all about his whole philosophy was about social interest. You know, they in Ubuntu, they say we are, be, I am because we are. It's all about that community. So educators, administrators, they stepped up during the pandemic and they did it. And now they're like, I'm done. So for me, educator burnout is a top, top priority right now. And I think we need, as administrators, we need to put teacher well-being at the top. We need to to prioritize happy teachers in the classroom with students. And one of my dearest, um, another person that I really um, respect and value is Thich Nhat Hanh. Um, and he said, happy teachers change the world. And that I've always had that hanging up in my office, happy teachers change the world. And I think that as, it, as administrators, we need to focus. Remember I said that that plan, that architect, we need to make sure that organizational health and well-being is at the forefront of the community and, and not just for teachers, for parents. Like we need to support the adults in the, in, in the building. So it's as simple as going back to connection, connection, connection. And what I didn't state earlier is that positive discipline is what we would call an encouragement model. Like it's through encouragement that we develop all of those life skills. So by making sure that every adult in the building and child have both of those emotional needs met of belonging and significance. So every adult should feel connected. They should feel a sense of belonging and they should feel that sense of purpose, significance. I can contribute and my contribution is valued. If administrators can make sure, let me tell you, if you, there's a, um, I don't know if you've read the book Drive by Daniel Pink mm -hmm. and he talks about, right? Like what motivates people even more than money? Encouragement, having a yeah. sense of purpose and being valued. Like, you know, and this is for like the corporate. So we need to apply that with relationships. And I think all these great wise people now, they just took the work of all these amazing people in the past that we didn't really know about so much, right? So we need to use encouragement. Teachers need encouragement. Like a plant needs water. A child, I didn't make that up. Rudolf Dreikers used to say, a child needs encouragement. Like a plant needs water. OK, so we really need to help everyone develop the belief that they're capable and feel that sense of belonging. So for administrators, that would be my my main focus is just organizational health and well-being and really focusing on everyone in the community, parents, teachers, administrators, support staff and students all feeling a sense of belonging and significance. 
Yeah, I love I love that. And and I appreciate that you bring up Drive when I think about the fact that it's you know been around a long time and millions of people have read it and yet they still aren't following that message and where it's at. And that um, you know, and studies have shown in the workplace that a little bit of encouragement is um, at least as powerful as a small raise, um, if not more so, depending on the situation and how far away from living wages people are, right? But it's like that, it matters so much more. So I appreciate hearing that. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of reiterate that that mindset uh, as a, a thing that we can do something about. And I love that you've got that, like that's an easy thing to do. Um, and final piece, Mel, and then I'll let you get talking about the like what's happening and what's on deck um, for more joy in our life um, is um, that I'm working with some educators that have taken courses, uh, workshops with you as well as read your book and, and are implementing that work there in um, Egypt. And the project that they're doing right now with their students. Uh, yeah, that's <laughs> such a sweet community. Um, but the project they're doing with their students right now is um, really about just, you know, routines in the classroom and classroom jobs and little things, which a lot of, you know, the the K-12 or pre-K through, through even sixth grade, that's a big part of it is like classroom jobs and responsibilities because they're teaching that stuff. But the way they're structuring it has everything to do with this being something that they come up with together, that the students are a part of that, and that the students are in charge of you did a good job stuff, like the encouragement piece of it. That is their number. If that's their kind of homework or their their challenge for the day is like they've got to find a way to give encouragement to others. And so just wanted to give you that little sprinkle of your work is, is not just <laughs> out there, but it's permeating in a really, really Aww. strong and positive student centered way. So thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As we um, start closing out the, the end of our hour together, um, Susanna, thank you so much for being my co-host today. Thank you. No, um, enjoy. Enjoy. thank you for sharing your wisdom and your, your expertise with us um, as well as being our first guest in our, Big Think to the Big Step uh, series. So in this series, um, what we have is educational thought leaders, just like Joy, sit down and share their work with us in a Big Think conversation, just like we did today. Um, and they get to continue with follow-up sessions in our What School Could Be community. So these follow-up sessions take a deeper dive into their new books. Um, and our community members can actually um, chat with and learn directly from these leaders. Um, so. Finally, these uh, sessions will conclude with a workshop called The Big Step, and then some of those strategies that have been shared will be practiced and implemented, hopefully, in the classroom. So they will end on a very practical note. Um, so please join us for um, more with Joy Marchese on Monday, February 6th, uh, 7 p.m. Eastern and 4 p.m. Pacific, um, and we'll also follow up on the 13th and the 27th as well. Um, as we look at her book, Positive Discipline for Today's Busy and Overwhelmed Parent, How to balance work, parenting, and self for lasting well-being. Mel, can I just share, well, I don't know if people know that you, anyone who registers, you send them the ebook. Correct. We have, right? um, yep, for the That's first huge. 25 people who come and uh, join in live in those sessions, we will give you a free ebook. Yeah, they don't even have to buy the book, which is amazing. Yes. So sign up quickly. And <laughs> Mel, I, I really want to thank you. Mel has been amazing at and diligent at chasing me up for like scheduling. And <laughs> thank you um, for that. I, I really want to appreciate all your support in, in scheduling this and Susanna for being here. And um, I'm just really grateful to be a part of this community that's really creating great change um, in education and just human beings. So thank you. No, I, I appreciate this. And, um, and I just wanted to also say thank you because you're bringing, you're reminding us all that we have roots um, to look at in, in education and neuroscience and everything else. The, the, all the work that you're talking about, you're talking about people born in the 1800s. And this has been around longer than our very structured industrialized system. And so if we can come back around to some of those mindsets, I think we're going to be in a really positive place. And, and it's important to connect the science with the emotions, with the research, with the metrics, and all the different ways that we can do this to help everybody really see there's a better way to do it. Um, I'm thinking right now about your daughter. And I just wanted to, to send out that, that good vibe and that maybe the, her teacher could start to shift her fingers a little bit by you saying, I'm not going to have my five-year-old doing homework every day. Talk to me about it as much as you want to. But it's I'm the parent and there's no nothing that tells me that 
worksheets for a five-year-old every day are going to help them to do anything, right? Um, and as Joshua pointed out earlier too, it's the first five minutes of most likely to succeed and where we're at with all of this of like kids are calling BS on all of it. So thank you for bringing that to light in a really big way. I do want to share just to, just to back up my student's teacher. She doesn't believe in it either. And I okay. think this is where we need to support educators Yes, is the fact that in public schools, they have to follow, whether it's Common Core, right. they're having to do this and it's going against their values, right? And what they, she wants to do mindfulness and play with the kids all day, which is what they should be doing, right? So that's the juggling act. I've been in her shoes where it's like we, you know, you're teaching AP Psych and you got to cover this. So I want to give, I know that the teachers are all doing, they're trying to balance yeah. the admin, the bureaucracy, the parents, right? And, and their own values. It's, it's a hard juggle. And no, thank you. I saw, I'm not on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, email, You're so, <laughs> or, or LinkedIn. Twitter's the only one I don't use. I, I, I just, I can't yeah. um, it's too much. So thank you. <laughs> I love that. And thank you for the shout out. You're right. Of course, all the educators are doing what they can. So how do we, how do we continue in the, the whole world of education to support that mindset and support the possibilities of change and support creating those cultural changes and leadership changes. Um, I look forward to hearing from some of our educational leaders who are listening to this conversation and, and seeing this work come to life in a stronger way of like, you actually can change your school culture. Um, yeah. So thank you for that and, and good luck and good luck to Chloe. I'm sure she's gonna find her happy because she gets to play school with you at home. I know, <laughs> she'll be okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and thanks everybody else um, for being here. Those of you contributing to the conversation and the questions today, we really appreciate it and look forward to seeing everybody in the book study as well as the big step at the end of that part of it. So thanks for all of that and for contributing your time, Joy. It's a, a deep honor and also just a big gift to the world of education that you're sharing your insights and knowledge with us. So thank you. It's a pleasure and a little treat. Jay Nelson will probably join us for at least oh. one of the sessions. So that, that'll be, but you'll have to see, I don't know which one yet, but she, <laughs> she's committed to coming to at least one, which is great. Oh, and she's, she's a wise, wise lady, I have to say. So, so people thankful. will have to tune into all of the sessions in exactly. order to. <laughs> and a little hint, even though the big step is where we really, it's more workshop and practical, even with this, you know, I, I, I will, the other two will be, they'll be, they'll be practical parts of, of all of them. So thank you. Thanks again, everyone.